Let's pray as we come to look at this passage. Father, we thank you so much for your word to us. We thank you that it speaks to us today. And as we think about this important um, issue of wealth or riches and poverty, that you give us clarity of thought to understand what you're saying to us in your name. Amen. I want to start with a question. What's better, to be rich or to be poor? I wonder what your instant reaction to that question is. Um, in a book by Oliver James, who was quite a popular psychologist back in the noughties, um, he wrote a book called Affluenza, about people's attitude to wealth and how it affected them. Uh, and in the book, he talks about um, different people he met. And one person he met was a guy called Sam. Sam lived in Manhattan in New York. He was a stockbroker and he earned 20 million pounds a year. Uh, and just in case that wasn't enough, um, he knew that when his father died, he would inherit a billion pounds. Um, he was incredibly rich. He was about 35. Um, he had had a heroin addiction, but he got over that. He now is addicted to sex with teenagers. Um, he was apparently paranoid and um, lonely. And Oliver James says he's not the sort of person you'd really want to hang out with. But he also says in New York he met a guy called Chet. Chet was a taxi driver. Um, he was a Nigerian immigrant, and he earned a thousand times less than Sam. But Chet was happily married. Uh, and although he was often um, beaten up or abused by his passengers, he had a really optimistic and positive outlook to life. Chet, Oliver James says, is the sort of person you'd want to hang out with. Sam definitely wasn't. Is it better to be rich or poor? That example might suggest that being poor is better than being rich. But then what about Bill Gates? Do you know Bill Gates? Founder of Microsoft. Most people's computers have got Microsoft on them. Maybe we can blame him for the screen not working today. <laughs> he... Um, he amassed a fortune through Microsoft, and when he retired, he invested much of it into a charity foundation, um, which he humbly called the Gates Foundation. Um, it is the second biggest charity foundation in the world. And although he may not agree with everything he does with it, he is seeking to really deal with big healthcare issues around the world, serious issues of poverty, and um, trying to improve education for many people around the world. If Bill Gates was poor, he wouldn't be able to do any of that. And then think about people in East Africa, particularly at the moment. We may be worried about the lost cost of living crisis in this country, and for some people that is very serious. But in East Africa, it is life-threatening. They've had four seasons where the rains have failed, and so the crops have been poor. They rely heavily on grain from Ukraine, which is not reaching them. If you read a Tear Fund website, it talks about a 12-year-old girl who says, um, every time we sleep at night, our stomachs rumble because we've had no food for days. For them, poverty is downright deadly. Surely it's better to be rich than to be poor. Well, may those examples show us that the answer to the question, is it better to be rich or poor, is not straightforward, is it? It's not a simple question with a simple answer. And as we come to the book of Proverbs, we see that it, there's many short, pithy little sayings. Um, and you could read one saying and think, well, that gives you a simple answer to the question of wealth and riches. There's lots about wealth and riches in Proverbs. But actually, we're not meant to take just one saying. We're meant to read all the sayings. We're meant to see the whole picture. And actually, the, the picture that Proverbs give is, gives is not a simple answer to how we should treat wealth or how we should treat riches and poverty. It's a balanced view, um, a slightly complex view, but one that actually gives us reality, real, real and a good understanding for the whole of life. So what does Proverbs say about riches and wealth? First of all, it says that wealth is good in a sense. Um, there's a proverb 10, 15 that says this, the wealth of the rich is their fortified city, 
but poverty is the ruin of the poor. We see, didn't we, in the example particularly of those in East Africa, that poverty is ruining them. And yet if you have wealth, you can find a certain amount of security in this life, can't you? For those people that have a, um, a mortgage and a house or a, a, own a house, um, have a good pension, you are much more secure, even in this country, than those who can't afford a house, are living in rental and maybe kicked out because your landlord decides to sell, out, sell up and then discover you can't afford to rent anywhere nearby and have to move far away. Your security is much weaker if you haven't got the money. Riches can be better. They can give you a more secure and happy life. Proverbs doesn't deny that. It admits that. There is a sense in which being rich or wealthier is better. And Proverbs also wants to help us understand how to be reasonably wealthy, how to be reasonably rich. Um, so one of the Proverbs that um, said read to us was, he who works his land will have abundant food, but the one who chases fantasies will have his fill of poverty. In other words, if you work hard, you'll be better off. Isn't this the sort of thing that children, um, teachers say to children in schools? I mean, maybe you remember this from when you were a child or you're, you try and say the same sort of thing to your children um, or grandchildren. You know, work hard at your education, work hard at your exams and you'll do well, you'll achieve, you'll get good results and ultimately you'll go on to a much better paid job and you'll be much better off in life. But if you waste your time because you're playing computer games all the time, or surfing social media, or smoking dope, whatever it is, then you'll fail your exams, and you'll end up in a difficult job, if any job at all, and with a minimum wage. And you won't have any wealth. Of course, there's wisdom in working hard, working hard at school, working hard at work, working hard to achieve wealth. The Bible encourages that sort of attitude. The Bible also says, and Proverbs also says, that riches comes with righteousness. It's maybe a more distinctive view than for our society. So Proverbs 13, verse 25 says, The righteous eat to their heart's content, but the stomach of the wicked goes hungry. And and again, doesn't this make sense? Um, If if you um, commit a crime, you end up with a criminal record, it's going to be much harder to get a good job. If you commit adultery and... um, you end up leaving your family and having to start up another family, you end up, may end up supporting two families and you'll be poorer as a result. If, if you're a salesperson and you, and you consistently lie about the things you're selling, then you'll get a reputation for being untrustworthy and no one will buy from you. In the short term, doing something wickedly or something um, wrong or lying in some way can look like it'll make you richer, but actually the truth is that generally in the long term, when we live righteous lives, we will be better off and wealthier. So actually wealth can be good and and Proverbs encourages us to live lives that will help us to become wealthy over time. To work hard and to be righteous. Of course, we do need to be careful with these Proverbs, don't we? Because you may think about people that have worked really hard but then for whatever reason maybe their business has collapsed and they've lost everything. Or people that seem to live really good lives and yet still seem to be cursed with poverty for whatever reason. There are exceptions to these rules, but those exceptions don't mean that the rules aren't true. It just means they're generally true. I mean, take smoking, for example. There are some people that smoke, chain smoke, and get to 90 years old. That doesn't mean that the general encouragement um, not to smoke because it'll ruin your health is not true, does it? They're an exception. The reality is that most people that smoke will die younger. It's a general rule we need to take seriously in life, even though there will be exceptions to it. And the same for these rules about riches and poverty. If we work hard, generally it will be true, you'll be better off. If you live a righteous life, generally it will be true, you'll be better off. There will be exceptions, but we need to live life in the light of the general truth. That's what Proverbs is saying to us. So wealth can be good, and Proverbs helps us to think about how we can be wealthier and richer. But that's not all it has to say. Because actually it wants to say to us as well that wealth is not the main thing. Wealth is not all that is important. 
So the first proverb that said read to us today says this, better a poor man whose walk is blameless than a rich man whose ways are perverse. Better a poor man whose walk is blameless than a rich man whose ways are perverse. That example of Sam and Chet at the beginning, wasn't that a great example of that proverb? There's Sam with all that wealth, and yet his ways are perverse. And there's Chet on a very minimum wage, and yet somehow he's happy. And actually, these, these proverbs that begin better one thing than something else, there's quite a number of them within the whole book of Proverbs. And most of them are to do with riches and wealth. Let me read a few more of them to you. Better a little with the fear of the Lord than great wealth with turmoil. Better a meal of vegetables where there is love than a fattened calf with hatred. That's not necessarily encouraging vegetarianism, by the way. (laughs) Better a little with righteousness than much gain with injustice. Better a dry crust with peace and quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. Better a poor man whose walk is blameless than a fool whose lips are perverse. What a man desires is unfailing love. Better to be poor than a liar. Do you see the sort of the picture that comes across when you start putting all these proverbs together? Um, yes, being rich or being wealthy can be good, can be helpful, but it's not the most important thing. Far more important is to have a happy home life. Far more important is to live a righteous and a good life. Far more important is to fear the Lord and have a relationship with God that leads to eternal life, something that riches can never give you. Um, Proverbs in the Bible as a whole is keen to say, don't run after riches as your main aim in life. In fact, Jesus says, doesn't he, in the Sermon on the Mount, seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Make those things your focus, not getting rich. Because riches, or at least running after riches, can often corrupt us. In fact, running after riches, running after wealth is in a way you might call greed. Greed. And greed is anti-gospel. It's anti the good news that we believe as Christians. Because actually as Christians we believe that that God is a generous God, don't we? We believe that he, he sent his son to die for us to pay the ransom that we could be forgiven. He paid the cost for our goods. The gospel is a gospel of generosity, which is the opposite of greed. So how can we as Christians live a life where we're trying, as one of our main aims in life, to make more and more money for ourselves? And you see, the the Bible is clear that when we start running after wealth for ourselves as one of our main priorities, then we tend to be lured into all kinds of wrong ways of thinking and wrong kinds of activity. And and some of the Proverbs that said read pick up on that. So so one of them um, is about exploitation, chapter 28, verse 8. It says, He who increases his wealth by interest gathers it for the one who is kind to the poor. He who increases his wealth by interest gathers it for the one who is kind to the poor. That word for kind is the same, way, same word in Hebrew that would be translated grace. We sing about God's amazing grace to us, his amazing generosity to us. But if we do that, surely we should be generous and gracious to others. We should be kind to the poor. Um, John Wesley, who um, you may, remember, may know is a, a famous 18th century um, preacher, founded a Methodist church. Um, he said this about riches and wealth. He said, you should earn all you can. So it's right to get as much money as you can. You should save all you can. So don't waste it. But then he said you should give all you can. Earn all you can, save all you can, give all you can. Be generous to the poor. Be generous to God's work. And in fact, I think John Wesley decided that he worked out how much money he needed to live on 
and then all the rest of his wealth he gave away. And he was very wealthy because he sold a lot of books. And if we're to be people that are generous to the poor, then isn't it more likely that God's going to give us more money so it's for us to give away if we're doing his work? But you see, running after interest in a way is actually exploiting the poor. You see, if someone becomes so poor, and I think this is the context in the Bible about charging interest, if someone is so poor that they become in desperate straits and they need to borrow some money just to get by, to pay off their debts or whatever, um, if you then take advantage of that situation and say, okay, I'll lend you some money, but, you know, 10% interest, if you're just trying to make money out of their difficult situation, then you're exploiting them. And so in the Old Testament, it says, don't charge interest. Now, it raises questions, doesn't it? doesn't it? Should we put money in banks so we do get interest from our money? Of course, lending money to banks is not quite the same thing as lending money to the poor. But we do maybe need to be more careful about asking the question, how are our banks behaving? Is your bank one that's actually trying to exploit people that are poor and make charge as much interest as possible to get as much money out of them as possible? Maybe we should be more careful about choosing the banks that we, set, we save our money with in order to avoid those sort of things happening. So exploiting the poor, and particularly by interest, is mentioned. But also, one of the big dangers of um, greed is that we become proud in the wealth that we come to. So verse 11 in chapter 28 says this, A rich man may be wise in his own eyes, but a poor man who has discernment sees through him. A rich man may be wise in his own eyes. And now, why is that? Because actually, if you, if you manage to get lots of money for yourself, particularly if it's not inherited, if you've done it by, by working hard and studying hard and, and doing business well and being clever and everything else, if you manage to make a lot of money, then there's that sense of success, isn't there? And, and with success comes pride. Look at how well I've done. And also, with all that money gives you a sense of security. We talked about that already. I've got all this money, I feel secure. And, and you can begin to think that your hard efforts, your cleverness, your work in amassing this money has brought you salvation and security based on the money that you have. And when you start thinking in that way, you're actually becoming proud and arrogant about your efforts and your success and your wealth and depending on that rather than God. And yet, as many other Proverbs say, money can quickly disappear. And as Jesus says, you can't take it with you when you die. We need God. Running after money, amassing lots of wealth can bring us pride and arrogance that can cut us off from God. It can be spiritually deadly. And then a desire for money can also lead us to become corrupt. So verse 21 is a bit of a harder verse to understand. It says, to show partiality is not good, yet a man will do wrong for a piece of bread. And what this is really talking about is bribery. So if someone's offering you money to, to do something that you think is wrong or is unfair, then you're being bribed. And actually, it's quite easy to begin to get into that habit of doing that in a way that even a small thing, even a piece of bread, might be enough to sway your opinion, to make a difference to the way you vote or you decide things. Bribery is corrosive to society. It's corrosive to our souls. It's anti-gospel because it gives up the truth for the sake of financial gain. And yet Jesus brings us the truth by giving up the glory of heaven to come and show us his ways on earth. And finally, covetousness, wanting more. In a way, this is greed, isn't it? It says in verse 22, a stingy man is eager to get rich and is unaware that poverty awaits him. That desire to get rich, to have more and more, and eager to get rich, that, that hurry to get rich, that hurry to have more wealth. You see, there is a sense in which earlier on when I talked about wealth being good and how Proverbs shows us how to get wealth, it's not talking about getting wealth quick. 
It says it's by hard work and by being righteous. It's a slow, gentle progress process that builds up your wealth that you need. But a desire to get rich quick, to, to win the lottery or to um, rob a bank or to um, trade with Bitcoin or whatever you want to do, finding ways to try and get rich quick tends to end in poverty, tends to fail. But actually, more importantly, when you're doing that, you're aiming for wealth rather than God. You're serving mammon, as Jesus says. It's anti-gospel. It's, an, it's trusting in money rather than trusting in the one who can truly save you. You see, pursuing wealth, running after money again and again in Proverbs is shown to be the wrong way to go. Yes, wealth can be good, but running after it is certainly wrong. And Paul in 1 Timothy, picking up on this, and it's worth reading the whole of chapter 6, but I just want to quote verse 10. Paul says this, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. You see what Paul is saying? The love of money, running after wealth, is a root of all kinds of evil. If that's your motivated life, if that's your aim in life, then it's likely to lead you to do all kinds of wrong and horrible things and certainly will destroy your faith. So wealth's pursuit is wrong. So what is better? Riches or poverty? It's not a simple answer, is there? But perhaps um, those verses from chapter 30 that said read at the end, um, in verses 7 to 9, perhaps they have the answer. Perhaps they are the summary of what Proverbs is trying to say overall. Um, chapter 30 is actually a bit different to the rest of Proverbs. It's um, written by a guy called Eger, and we don't know much about Eger, other than we're told he's inspired, so he's worth listening to. Um, and, and chapter 30 doesn't have like, very short Proverbs like the rest of the Proverbs. They tend to be slightly longer. Um, and in the rest of the Proverbs, there's no prayers, but in chapter 30, there's a few prayers. And this is one of them. And Eger prays, prays this in verses 7 to 9. He says, Two things I ask of you, O Lord. Do not refuse me before I die. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. Two things he asked. Now, commentators aren't agreed on what the two things are. Is, it, is, is one of the things to do with wealth and the other to do with falsehood and lies? No, I think, I think with some other commentators that what he means, the two things here are poverty and riches. Uh, and does, does Ego want poverty or riches? What does he choose? Neither, he says. I don't want to be rich. And I don't want to be poor. Because both of them lead me away from truth, from, from truth into falsehood and lies. Why? Well, as we've seen, having lots of wealth can have a big temptation, lead to a big temptation to be proud, to think we have security, to think we're safe and don't need God's help. Having too much wealth, he worries, will make him say, well, who is the Lord? Will ruin his relationship with God, will ruin his trust in God, will ruin his humility before God. He doesn't want to be poor either because being poor makes you desperate. And when you're desperate, you might start doing things and be tempted to do things that you know are wrong, like stealing, and so dishonor God as well. So he says, I don't want to be rich. I don't want to be poor. He wants the Goldilocks zone. He wants it to be just right in the middle. And what is just right? He says, give me only my daily bread. Give me the portion I need to live on in life. And Jesus, of course, doesn't he? I'm sure he picked up already. Jesus picks up on what Ager says. When Jesus teaches us to pray in the Lord's Prayer, what is that line? Give us today our daily bread. He's actually quoting Ager. It's a summary of our attitude that we need to be wise about wealth and riches and poverty. 
Don't run after being rich and wealthy. And if you do end up being rich and wealthy, give it away. And of course, don't allow yourself to slip into poverty. You know, work hard. Live a righteous life. Don't mess up. Try and earn what you need. But aim for the middle zone. Aim to have just enough. And keep as your main priority seeking God's kingdom and his righteousness and not worrying about wealth and riches. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word to us. We thank you for the wisdom it gives. And we pray that you would help us to live out that wisdom in our everyday lives. Not to run after riches and wealth, but to seek you first. In your name we pray. Amen.